Okay, so we are um, outside of Denver now, and as we're driving to return the rental car, I saw um, Jason pointed out that this uh, Anschutz Medical Campus connected with the University of Colorado uh, was just off the highway. And I was like, oh, we have to go back, <laughs> um, drop by after on the way back, because my actually my very first activist engagement, unknowingly, I had no idea where this road was going to go, but was related to Philip Anschutz and the Foundation for a Better Life character ads. Um, and when my child was in fifth grade at a magnet school in Philadelphia, uh, they had the parents pay for these magazine subscriptions, these sort of little newspapers, um, and included in the newspapers, which it was crazy that that these papers were not part of the curriculum and they were asking parents in a public school to pay for them. But also within the context of these little sort of newspapers that the kids were supposed to read and do homework on, there were these ads for Foundation for a Better Life and they were, they were sort of character development. And these are the billboards you see all over the place, like, you know, stamina, pass it on, love, pass it on. And there's like a big picture and then on the other side is a white, you know, background and then the slogan for Foundation for a Better Life. And I thought, well, this, Actually, I'm not super comfortable with this being in the school, particularly because when I, I peeled back and looked at where, who was funding this campaign, it was Philip Anschutz, who was Colorado's among his, the first billionaires here in Colorado. And I saw that he was um, backing, his, his money came out of the oil industry initially, and then railroads, and then telecommunications, and then later into uh, entertainment and media and resorts. And he's also, because of his oil, holdings like one of the the um, hundred people who own the most land in the United States and he also is you know I was in an urban Philadelphia school and his positions were very decidedly conservative and he had taken stands that were um, somewhat in opposition to the norms within urban school districts and I thought well this doesn't seem right that, that parent you're asking parents to underwrite this and I actually succeeded to get it out of our school system but the more I looked into Anschutz and character education um, and his fortune in, um, in philanthropic giving including a 90 million dollar gift in 2006 that led them to rename this whole medical complex campus after him that there's this element of individuals with great wealth who've amassed it um, somewhat through, <laughs> through controversial means. I mean, some of the oil drilling that he wanted to do were in areas of Montana that had ancient petroglyphs, right? And he, he, the Bush presidency signed off and said, sure, you can do exploratory oil drilling here. And that, that, that was contested. And then eventually, even though they got permission, they decided it was not financially feasible. But, you know, this is someone who would love to give you um, a billboard to tell you how to go about your life. And yet he, it's not, he's not above making his money drilling into sacred lands with petroglyphs, right? And so these are the people who are getting to tell everyone else, the, the unwashed masses, uh, what it is to have good character in the world. And so, you know, I successfully sort of got that magazine out of my child's school, and that was my very first step into, you know, individuals can have a voice and sort of point out when things are not right. And, and hopefully, you know, when things turn out well, it goes the right way. But so anyway, behind me, is uh, this the, this uh, the, the campus? So the University of Colorado Medical System originally started in the nineteen early uh, two, uh, 1900s in Boulder, and then by the teens twenties it had outgrown its its facilities in Boulder and moved into Denver, and it continued to grow. And then this was Fitzsimmons Military Hospital, and during it actually started in World War One, and it was set up to treat soldiers uh, who were diagnosed with tuberculosis. And so that was the initial um, function. And then later, the, the facility expanded greatly during World War II. And that's the, the type of building that is behind me, um, this Fitzsimmons Medical Complex. Now, among the people treated here was uh, President Eisenhower. Uh, he had a heart attack and he uh, went through his recovery here. This was like one of the top military hospitals in the country at the time. And, you know, I want to just ground all of this as we examine the health systems and what's advancing is knowing that the goal of the most powerful interests in the world, which are a very small number of people, but who wield great power through their access to influence and policy and money, is to transform what we think of humans today into this evolved human machine combination in resonance with 
um, this internet of bio nano things, right? And all of this is a military construct and much of this research is developed through the Defense Advanced uh, Research Projects Agency, so DARPA. So it's interesting to me that Eisenhower spent a good amount of time here, but he also was the same individual who launched DARPA and hired Neil McElroy of Procter & Gamble to, to lead it in the early phases. So I think the context of mainstream medical interventions as being integrated in with military research and military programs is really important. Now, eventually, um, the program continued to grow and grow, and we might get some footage, but this is a very large campus. Uh, there's a number of these early military buildings here. Eventually, the, the military element was uh, shut down and moved to, I think, Fort Sam Houston in Texas. Um, but the University of Colorado adopted all of the buildings. And then as we drove in, and this is quite a substantial campus, construction everywhere. And, and, and um, I can attest that in Philadelphia, around the University of Pennsylvania, you can see where the money is by the construction. So much construction going into medical research and hospitals and development of this, this biotechnology and synthetic biology, and also a lot of it connected with children's hospitals and, and the cancer treatment, because we know that there's this overlap between um, genetic in intervention and molecular engineering and uh, precision medicine treatments that are often framed within the context of cancer or neurological disease. So, um, you know, this is, this is a key element. When Anschutz gave the money, uh, the campus continued to expand in 2006. It was renamed. Many uh, research institutions were co consolidated here across many departments, so they were they essentially are creating a hot house atmosphere, right? So this is a hospital. This is research and development. This is uh, training medical students. It is to reinforce the predominant narrative of what health treatment will be in this 21st century, in the world that we are supposed to live as cyborgs <laughs> or human plus or biotechnology subjects, um, consumers of biotechnology and synthetic biology products. All of this happens because they control the narrative. They, they pull very bright individuals, they train them up in this established medicine context, and then they roll it out in un, with unquestioning because you're never offered an alternative viewpoint. So the integration of the academic with the uh, institution and with the research and development is key to all of this. And also the public-private partnerships because the University of Colorado is by, in and of itself is a public institution, ostensibly. Um, so I wanted to point out when they were doing this consolidation, they established the Colorado School of Public Health. Now, we all want to be healthy. <laughs> we, we all want to be well. Um, but the public health systems, as we understand social impact investing, which is um, health is United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number three, and the imperative is to have it be data-driven and have it under constant biosurveillance. You know, their goal is eventually that you will have nanobots pulsing through your body like you know to give you some sort of super longevity or bionic augmentation processes and who knows how long it will take to get there but this is this is how scientists talk that this is their, the future that they have planned you'll have you know a blockchain neural economy in your mind to regulate your thoughts and optimize us all as digital citizens in the the holographic reality and so public health is essentially guiding this path into a post-human existence or a human plus existence. And I would say most of the people who enter into the public health space, they have no idea. They don't know about the Moonshot Project. They don't know about the internet of bio nano things. They're just brought in and told that they're gonna be trained to help people. They're gonna be trained to address illness and sickness and to be of assistance because that's what most people wanna do. They go into medicine because they wanna help people. They're not told about the backdrop. They're not told about the military uh, biosurveillance elements. They're not told about any of that stuff. And they're not meant to know. They're, not, they're meant to be kept in the dark. And I was just telling Jason on the, the drive-in, I said, I feel at this stage that if you're a healthcare professional or you're in research and development and you're not actively engaged with the ethics, the bioethics of the human plus agenda, the human plus narrative, you're not doing your job because this is a discussion that needs to be robust and it needs to be had publicly. And, and Jason responds, he's like, they don't know, Allison, they just don't know. 
Um, where did they get their information? They got them from their professors, they got them from the news, they got them from a very insular place, no one's handing them, Nippon Telegraph and Telephone's digital twin program that's talking about optimizing humans through the digital twin, through their digital identity, and how that fits in with electronic health records and blockchain health records, of which Colorado is a leader, an innovator in the electronic blockchain healthcare record space. No one is talking about the ethics of preventative health care that is going to be in, intrinsically linked with social prescribing in a panopticon with wearable technologies where they will target vulnerable populations that have been had long-term health consequences due to generation intergenerational trauma and using those as an investment market so that you turn those people and those children into data on dashboards and then um, due to their diabetes due to their addiction issues uh, due to their heart issues and then you manage them as like cattle um, you know as a as a commodity as a futures crop in the wellness space and we can see that very clearly in how the COVID narrative was laid out in the early months, the disproportionate impacts on black and brown communities, the disproportionate impacts on people in urban areas. And it was all, it's all teeing up a future of wellness, but prescribed wellness, wellness that you are on Medicaid or Medicare and you don't have a choice but to plug into the system where they say the public health providers, your social welfare navigators tell you, this is your to-do list today. And you know what? we'll know if you check in at the walking trail and what your Fitbit step count is because we can watch you remotely. We can track you across the course of a month to make sure that you meet our expectations. Now, we're not gonna fix the world around us to make your life easier. We're just gonna plug you into a specific set of expectations. And that's not fair, <laughs> especially once you have giant markets riding on this. And these are markets that were being directed by billionaires, people like Philip Anschutz. So this naming opportunity, it's not purely about helping people. This is an investment. This is an investment. And it's an investment knowing that people, it's very hard to question things like public health. Right? And the building behind Jason is actually a special building dedicated to the health and wellness of Native Americans who are among the most targeted by these impact markets because of the ongoing intergenerational trauma. Those people will be targets of social prescribing. Um, as we are walking up the sidewalk, they have these little banners, you know, you know, reminders about distancing and masks and all this stuff. But it had one of the banners, you know, said the Anschutz steps. Now we know if you look at step count regulations and wearable technologies <laughs> and you mix it in with piezoelectric human energy harvest, you mix it in with smart shoes and smart sidewalks and smart pavements and you're looking at um, social prescribing people into using their bioelectrical energy to power the metaverse, those step count banners that say, oh, the average, you know, American only has 6,500 steps a day, but the average Colorado is 7,500 steps. Go Colorado, right? And on the surface, that all looks great because, yeah, we totally would like step, you know, people to be healthy and have time to get out and walk and enjoy fresh air and like <laughs> have fresh air that isn't geoengineered. We would love all of those things, but that's not happening because they're weaponizing the environment around us and then making us act out like they're puppets in space under the guise of wellness. And do I think any of these people walking by here know this? They don't know. Who's going to tell them? Because they're going to go to, like, just like when we were in Austin, we went to the, the, the um, I think it was the Ascension Healthcare Hospital and the workers, and they're trained up in social prescribing because they're like, oh, it's better than treating illness. Well, sure, but not if you put someone on a blockchain identity and you're betting on their futures and you're tracking them through wearable technologies and you're tracking their step counts and they're, you're making their life impossible. And you're tell, you're social, maybe you're prescribing them special foods to eat based on their genetic makeup, right? This is, <laughs> it's eugenics. <laughs> This is eugenics and it's human plus and all of the bioethicists, all of the public health people should be asking right now why we're doing this. But the reason why we're doing this, the reason why they're gonna prescribe us good health behaviors, good character behaviors, the foundation for a better life. The foundation for a better life that they're imagining is nanotechnology, is alternative energy, is sustainable energy, where we are the batteries. And those who are most at risk are the ones who are centered in this investment market. And it's all because of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 3, 
which will be telehealth, telemedicine, remote advice from your avatar health fitness mentor tracking you in this video game that is ultimately the CIA's video game. Niantic and you could tell. It's, it's this game. And it's not right. It's not, none of this is right. So anyway, take a look. The context is military. <laughs> um, the context is billionaires. Um, people who've made money in oil, right? And then the new oil is telecom. And now the new telecom is internet of bio nano things. And then how you respond to their media. And also the other last thing I'll say is Anschutz is a huge supporter of sports stadiums which again, we know that the live entertainment venues and the sports venues are the most rigorous about the QR code access and managing your, your identity, your, your health status in relationship to your ability to participate in sports and music and, and performances. And he's specifically interested in soccer, the major league soccer here in the US. And I think that's important to know because my contention continues to be that their goal is that the metaverse be coded by the global south be coded by black and brown kids, and soccer is this global enterprise. The RoboCup um, uh, robot soccer program, they chose soccer because it, of a global interest and in specifically in countries that they will be targeting to be the coders of the metaverse. And um, you know, who knows, maybe they'll put like uh, connect and haptics and make it a video game and connect your, your building the metaverse to some stupid, you know, wellness count and call it aerobic exercise. I don't know, like maybe that's a, a bit too far, but um, I think these are all things that all of us need to be talking about. And particularly, you know, I know it's hard if this is your paycheck or you've gone into all this debt to go to medical school, but unless you want to live outside of a physical body and mind and space by 2050 or, or consign your children or your grandchildren to that future, we need to talk about this and we need to talk about it now.